Okay, so we're back in our study of Acts. I feel like we took a break for some reason, but we did. That's bad when the pastor doesn't remember what we preached last Sunday. That's, that's really bad. Or it's a sign of age, I don't know. Anyway, we're back in Acts 19. And uh, we're studying, we're looking at um, the life of the church and kind of like a snippet in the life of the church as things happen in the ministry of Paul. He's on his third missionary journey and things are happening. Things are not stationary, you know. And for example, it says here in the first, well, Beth just read, so I'm not going to read that again. I'm going to put it on the screen, but, you know, ooh, that's small. Um, we have this uh, ministry of Paul now in, in Ephesus. Paul left the Apollos in Corinth and he moved on and he arrived in Ephesus. And it says here, it happened that he met this uh, disciples, some disciples that were there. So my question is, you know, what's up, you know, what's about this random meeting? It's a small observation, but you know, as Paul came from Ephesus, sorry, from Corinth to Ephesus, he met these disciples, some disciples. And, you know, some people may call it random, but I call it God's appointing or God appointed meetings. And I probably hope you remember that I've told you, and probably it's not just me. I bet you some of you guys do that without even my prompting, uh, to pray for, for these divine encounters. That it would just happen that we meet people that need to hear the grace of God need to hear the gospel, need to, to receive some love and attention. Or sometimes people that might need, need to receive maybe a rebuke, a correction, somebody to just bring them back on the right path. I don't know. Just pray for this. You know, say, Lord, use me. And as I step out the door today, bring into my path the people that you want me to meet. This is that intentional walk with the Lord. Anyway, let's go on. So he meets some disciples. What kind of disciples? When we hear this word, we think Christians, correctly? We think disciples, that's the term we use for Christians. Well, <coughs> sorry, these guys were probably John's disciples. I'm not probably, they were John's disciples, which means what? If you go back to the book of John, uh, if you think about the first chapter of John, it's with the ministry of, of John the Baptist. This is the guy here in, in case, John the Baptist. What kind of ministry did he have? Remember? If you did not read those chapters, you know, let me tell you just briefly. He was calling people to repentance because Messiah was about to come. That was his message. He was preparing the way, and as he did prepare the way, he brought this baptism of repentance, which was not new for the Jews. The Jews had this idea of baptism as a washing of sins. Even from back in the Leviticus 14, if I remember correctly, when God said how to clean, I think it was a house from, from the house, the leper of the house with, with water, you know, hint, hint, if you guys want to just study Leviticus with this in mind, look at the how water is used in Leviticus and think about the meaning of that. But that's a whole different study. I'm not going there. It's a rabbit hole, so I'm stepping away from it. So John's baptism, it was a baptism of repentance in preparation for, for Jesus. And Paul says clearly here, you know, Paul says in verse 4, you want to back here if you don't have the Bibles with you, but Paul says in verse 4, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, which is what I just said, Telling people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. So Paul makes it clear. You guys have received something that's just the preparation, the, the appetizer, the, uh, yeah, just the laying of the foundation. But what, it truly, what you truly need is to meet Jesus. To have this baptism of faith, of repentance, sorry, of faith in Jesus. And when these people heard... I love this. It was that this immediate transformation. They, they said, I mean, no, they didn't say nothing, actually. It says, <coughs> when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And don't make, don't make too big of a thing here about they were baptized just in the name of Jesus. We can go back to Matthew 28 and know they probably were baptized in the name of Jesus, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You know, typical formula, so don't make this a theology. But they were baptized. And even more, <coughs> as Paul laid hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. And as a recall of, of what I said in the previous you know, 17, 18 chapters of, of the book of Acts, 
I see this giving of the Spirit in very specific moments so far. In Acts 2, we know the church was born and the Spirit came upon the church. In Acts 8, the Samaritans, the hated Samaritans, receive the Spirit as they repent. And there is unity between the Jews in Jerusalem and the Samaritans because they got the same Spirit. In Acts 10, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, receive salvation and they also are given the Spirit. Again, the church is united because they said, they have the Spirit, we have the Spirit, we are one. The church is kept unified, not the Gentile church, not the Jewish church, but the church of Christ. And the sign of unity was the giving of the Spirit of God with these visible signs of, <coughs> of speaking in tongues and prophesying. You know, so this is again, to me, one of those moments where God gives his Spirit as a sign of my ministry continues even amongst the disciples of John as they receive salvation they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a problem here, and probably, I'm not sure if you're aware of it or not, um, there's a translation, I think it's RSV or ASV, I'm not sure, one of them, that has this, uh, this phrase, did you receive, the question comes this, did you receive, sorry, okay, did you receive the Holy Spirit since you were, since you believed? Here is when you believed. Do you see a difference? If I say, did you receive the Spirit when you believed? Or if you received the Spirit since you believed? Because of that translation, you know, our uh, uh, brothers, Pentecostals, have this theology of the second blessing that you first get saved, and then at some sometime afterwards you receive the second blessing, which is the filling of the Spirit. And because of that word, when versus since. I'm not sure what King James says. Dave has King James the old faithful. It's in verse 2. I haven't checked actually for uh, King James. But anyway, <coughs> I don't want us to focus on, on this. You know me, I, I try to look at the bottom line, at the real meaning of this passage, not to just to look at how can we can di differentiate theologies, you know, from this into that. The point is, they received the Spirit. Since. It says since, okay? That, that word, the difference between when and since is big. You know, uh, but modern translations all have the word when there. So, and that makes a big difference. But the point is this, God gave them the Spirit. The issue of the Spirit here is the same as before, a unifying ministry of God, God's Spirit in the church over there. And we're not here to discuss, you know, whether we have or not a second blessing. We're here to reiterate or to affirm again that we need the filling of the Holy Spirit. We'll come back to this at the, at the conclusion. But one of the prayers I pray for myself is that God would allow me to be filled with the Spirit continuously. I know that some days are just different than other days and just I kind of lack that power or that full, filled, fullness or filling. But boy, that's, that's my prayer. And sometimes living in the flesh, following your own priorities, removes that feeling from you, makes you walk empty and powerless. Anyway, my firm conviction is that the Spirit confirms their integration of the disciples into the church and that we have this succession of events in the life of a believer. We have repentance and faith, we have baptism, and we have the giving of the Spirit, which ought to happen in very fast succession, if not right then. I was having a blessing, a blessed meeting with with John, <laughs> he's walking away right now, but uh, we discussed the meaning of repentance this week and how repentance and faith work together and how God blesses us and brings us to the fullness of ministry. So this is, what this is what happens here. The disciples of John are brought into the fullness of their faith in Christ, the Messiah, whom John has pro uh, proclaimed before. So anyway, um, I have a note here about the divine appointments. But actually, I just said this before in the beginning. You know, was that a random meeting? Did it just happen? It says these words here in, in uh, NSB. <coughs> it happened as he passed. He found all this vocabulary sounds like happenstance. But was it? And I believe again that God has ordained this moment. But ministry continues. Paul continues to spend. Actually, after he met with his disciples, he went to the synagogue as he was his his. his as it was his habit. And there he spoke boldly for 
three months. That was a long service in the synagogue. Remember, three months? Just, just you, you complain about me speaking 40 minutes? He spoke three months. You know, June, sorry. They met every Saturday and they spoke together. Paul taught every Saturday in the synagogue for three months. And he wore, used these words, he uh, reasoned with them. He explained, he taught, he brought the Bible, I mean the scriptures, the Old Testament. He reasoned with them and he also he persuaded them about the kingdom of God. That's the ministry of a teacher. He took the Bible that they had, which is the Old Testament, and he just explained to them who Jesus is. And the results are, are awesome. You know, some, I mean, of course. Uh, actually, it says here, this is not the awesome part. The awesome part, awesome part is later. But in this place, in the synagogue, some of them became hardened, it says here, and disobedient. Hardened and disobedient. And they spoke evil of the way before the people. The way is a Christian way is the church of god that's how uh, luke calls uh christianity in, uh, in a couple of times here is the way okay so when uh, when op opposition came which was something very common for paul he moved to a school which meant probably a building of some guy who taught philosophy or who knows what he was talk, uh, uh, teaching and usually he was teaching in the middle of the day if you haven't been in greece something happens in greece between like one to about six uh, in the afternoon and that what happens is that nothing happens I mean everybody takes a break I was I was with Anna in Greece in uh, 2007 actually I was not far I was in Thessaloniki actually no this is Ephesus it's all the way the other side uh, but um, we were surprised that every store was closed at like I think it was two o'clock and everybody was taking a nap and having a you know nice walk or whatever they had a glass of you know water or something and life started again until about uh, about six o'clock and then he went on to like one o'clock in the morning you know but paul was there usually teaching in that dead time when he was not working and he used that time to teach it says here i think daily for two years two years he spent <coughs> he spent that time over there teaching them of course about the way about jesus christ two years of of ministry and it says here and this is the awesome result all that lived in Asia, which is the province of Asia, the Roman province of Asia, heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greek. They all heard the word. Where was Peter? Sorry, where was Paul? He was in Ephesus. But through his ministry, it says that all in Asia heard the word of God. And this is, this is used actually by some of um, theologians today to advocate about ministry in the city, like Toronto. When you have a ministry here where people come and go, come and go, come and go, it's a, it's a big town. Actually, what happens is if someone comes to our church, spends a couple of years because of a job, and then he moves or she moves somewhere else, and they were taught here the way of Christ. As they leave, they leave as a blessing, and the word gets spread out. You know, the church in Moldova that you guys know I'm so fond of, it's a small church, about 40 people. But in the last 20 years, I'd say probably... 500 or more youth and young adults and, uh, and mature people received the gospel and became Christian at church. More than 500. But they all moved on. with That's Moldova, you know, a country of uh, 4.5 million and only 1.5 or something are in the country. The rest are all working abroad. But of these kids that are, have been, you know, brought to salvation in the church of, in, in Badiku, in Moldova, many of them are now in Kishina or in Bucharest or <coughs> in Europe or even North America, some of them, in the U.S. More, most, most, uh, more precisely, and they went there as Christians. And that's how the gospel spreads. That's a small notice here on this issue of the whole of Asia hearing the word of the Lord. And even more, it says here that God performed miracles. As Paul was working daily to consolidate the church, to teach the church, as he persevered, God also brought miracles. I mean, it says God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were carried from his body to the sick and the disease left, left them and the evil spirits went out. This is something we have not seen in, in, in today. But you know what? I, do you guys argue with God or when you pray? You know, there, there are times when I drive home up to Newmarket and, you know, it's a 40 minute, 30 minute, 40 minute drive. And my mind wanders. I just talk to God. And sometimes I give thanks to God. Sometimes I, I plead with God. But sometimes just ask, God, 
I, I want to say something of this. Why cannot we, and I know that God doesn't give you an answer, or if the gospel is probably in the book of John that says, in, uh, or describes a faith based on miracles as being the baby faith, and God was, wants to have a faith that's based more than just in miracles. But boy, as I pray for Moses, like this young man that we prayed for this morning, I want to see a miracle. I want to get a phone call from Peter saying, God has brought him home safe and healed. And God opened the door for Moses to come to Canada. I want to, I want to pray and I want to expect miracles. And that's probably one of the key things is expectations. It is not in the Bible here, not, not in this passage, just the thought I have. How much do we expect the supernatural? How much do we expect that falling or coming down the Spirit of God and the move of God as we persevere in the daily chores, daily teaching, daily... Uh, what's the word I use here? Um... Daily, daily perseverance, that was the word. Daily perseverance in our walk, whatever it is, we're teachers or retired people or uh, engineers or whatever. How much do we expect the miraculous to happen? Because if we don't, I mean, what separates us from a, just a, a club, you know, a social club? What makes the church different is the presence of the Holy Spirit and the Son of God in our midst. And we should expect God to work in miraculous ways. Against the nature, against what the nature says. I want to pray. I do pray for Rudy, my brother here. I want to see miracles in Rudy's life. Pray for John Lee. And I, I, you get my point. I don't want to give you my prayer list now, but I want to see God at work. And I want you guys to think about this. How much do I expect God to work even the impossible? I had this message back in at uh, Strive at the retreat. How impossible is the impossible? Actually, it was a sermon I preached here years ago. How impossible is the impossible? That's the faith I want us to have and grow in. So anyway, why am I here? Okay, I was supposed to click and I just forget to click. Something happens here, even more besides the teaching, besides the miracle of, of God, as, uh, as uh, Paul continued to persevere teaching the church. Uh, we see something interesting. I'm going to just give you the, 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 the zest of it. You know, so the background is this. God was performing extraordinary miracles by hands of Paul. So handkerchiefs or aprons were carried and disease were left, uh, left them and the evil spirits went out. All these things attracted attention. And amongst the, those were some Jewish exorcists, people who dealt with the spiritual things in some ways. And uh, they went from place to place as here. I'm not going to read the whole passage. And they attempted to name over those who had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And, you know, short story long, actually, long story short, they tried this and they failed. And they left with their, you know, ego bruised and not just the ego probably also their skin was uh, was probably bruised too so what is the point here there is power in the name of Jesus there's no doubt about this there is power in the name of Jesus but this power comes in the context of personal faith faith cannot be secondhand a very proof here says, I preach, so I, I adjure you, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul is preaching. And what does the demon say? I know Jesus. I know about Paul. But who are you? I, I can just, I, I want to just imagine that. I, I, this conversation, I have no idea how this thing took place, but just imagine being there. You know, these guys, seven sons of Sheba, whatever this name is pronounced in English, uh, seven guys were known as exorcists, they deal with this demon and they say, you know, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, go away. And the government says, I know Jesus, <laughs> duh, I mean, we know that. And I've heard about Paul, which is, makes me know how much, what reputation did Paul have amongst the demons? If this demon says, oh, I know about Paul, who are you? You know, this is the result. And the point is here is not, you know, to try to uh, repeat what this guy is. The point is this. Faith has to be firsthand. 
Faith has to be yours. Faith cannot be secondhand. And there is power in the name of Jesus. And those who are his children can call upon the name of Christ. And Jesus is our strength. You know, but the point is, there cannot be a secondhand faith that can be active. You can try, but the result is, who are you? You know, and I want us to have that kind of a life, you know, expecting the miraculous to happen, being filled with the Spirit of God, that and as we pray, the church, as, as the church prays, the devil knows. I remember, you know, the, the impact of, of good teachers. My first pastor was a great teacher. I remember his, uh, one of his sermons, I can visually even imagine, it was my C pastor uh, Alex and his, uh, uh, you know, him teaching, and he says, there are churches that have you know, demons who kind of like oversee, them. not oversee, but like kind of watch, watch them, you know, kind of like keeping an eye on them. And those, some, some demons are like, you know, just bored, because nothing happens there. They're just bored. And some demons, when they come across, you know, around the church, they just, this is my imagination, of course, it's not in the Bible, this is my imagination. You know, they're like, oh, I know them. Stay away from them. They're danger, they're bad news. You know, I want this to be bad news for the, for the devil. I want you guys to be bad news for the devil. If you think it's not biblical, think Romans 16, 20. Who knows Romans 16, 20? The God, oh, let me actually read. I don't want to make things up. If it, okay, let's see who opens up the Bible before me. Romans 16, 20. And the God of hope will soon crush. Okay. And the God of peace, sorry. The God of peace will soon crush Satan. Where? How? Under your feet, under our feet, he will be crushed. And it's you who will be the crushing. Okay? And why? Because there is power in the name of Jesus. Don't let the devil lie to you that you're powerless. For the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Romans 16, 20. Keep that in mind. Okay. So that was the first, uh, if you want, power encounter. And the result is awesome. I mean, once this happens, look what happens in the church, sorry, sorry in the area right there. This became known to all, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus. Do I have this? Yep. Uh, okay. Um, many of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began to burn them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them, of the books, and found it 50,000 silver, pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing i love this the word of god was prevailing imagine the society where well the word sorry the world is being caught into spiritual practices for evil and dark and deep uh, you know based on on you know demonic and god comes with the light when these guys here they brought this stuff their books their <coughs> whatever the tools of the trade they had and they burned them why because they understood the difference between God and a, just a demon. And they knew whom they should fear and whom they should honor. And they recanted and repented. They changed. They just, it was a turn, a turn around of life, a repentance, if you want, of these people. This, this personal holiness choice, that was costly. And I love the way it says here, it was 50,000 pieces of silver of, book, of books that were burned. That was a lot of money in those days. You know, the sacrifice, or if that was sacrifice, the choice to follow Jesus, yeah, may come to, uh, with a, a, a price in, in humans, human terms, but it's so much more blessing in God's eyes. You may lose, quote unquote, stuff here. If you're honest, if you change your life, you don't lie anymore, if you don't steal anymore, you may lose stuff here, but you gain so much because of Jesus. Anyway, the world is being changed around Paul, around the gospel, because Jesus is at war, because God's spirit is at work. And even that <coughs> brings something, a disturbance. Okay. 
I keep forgetting that I need to have this to, to click. I'm, uh, it's, <coughs> sorry, it's a long passage now. I'm going to read the whole thing. I'm just uh, going to uh, uh, read uh, the first few verses, um, 21 through 20, um, 24. Now, after these things were finished, which is the, the thing with the, um, the seven uh, exorcists and the people repenting and burning books. So after things were finished, Paul purposed, purposed in his spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, As I have been here, I must also see Rome. After having sent into Macedonia two of, his, of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, and that's the part you need to listen to, I mean, you do listen to the whole thing I say. Anyway, about that time there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines to, of Artemis, Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. So what happens here? You have the city of Ephesus, where this uh, economy was based on the worship of Artemis. If you think it's like the mono-industrial uh, towns or cities in North America which depend on like one big factory and if that factory goes bust the whole city goes bust you know so this city was famous for being the place where Artemis was worshipped and everything around revolved around Artemis you know a, a small example is there is this small town in uh, Romania called Bran B-R-A-N which became famous uh, for uh, two reasons one it's got a really nice castle built in about the 1500s 1600s maybe 1600s really beautiful castle but then Bram Stoker if you know the name Bram Stoker wrote a novel and said Dracula lived in this place which actually never happened like ever never ever he never even touched uh, you know, set foot in that in that castle the real I mean the real Dracula not the book one but you know what when you go to the gate of the castle there's this magnificent uh, open yard open open air um, market with all these tourist trap things all the Dracula mugs Dracula fungs Dracula things Dra everything is Dracula you know why because the economy of the place is based on that one book this Bram Stoker wrote which brought wealth to this small village because it is the place where Dracula lived imagine if they actually listened to the the the, the the guides, the tour guides at the castle said, he actually never stepped foot here. You know what? None of the tourists care. They read the book. It's this place. I'm going to buy the mug. You know, pay the 20 bucks for a mug, you know, or even more. Well, this happened in, 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 in Ephesus. It was the place of Art Artemis. We live, we get money because we make stuff, we sell stuff, all because of the name of Artemis. And what happened here? People became Christians. And they saw Artemis as, it, as what it is for real, as you know, nothing, an idol, nothing else. And they began to no longer buy you know, silver shrines, no longer pay money. And these guys are hurt. You know, it says here, actually, I'm going to uh, summarize. It's, if you just read, if you want at home, uh, Acts 19, 21 to 41. But it says here, our prosperity depends on this business. This is what Demetrius said. Guys! Our prosperity is based on this business. There is danger to our trade, he said. There is danger to the temple. And bottom line, he says, there is danger even to Artemis, the goddess. She may fall into disrepute. So let's do something. And what they do is mob rage. Demetrius was probably a good speaker. You know, I can give him that. Good speaker, he brought this, this mob to a frenzy and they began to uh, just stand up against against the Christians but the reason was not theological it was just economic it was greed if you want it was greed <coughs> at work here and this is what happens when the gospel turns the way sorry the world upside down around you people get saved from all the previous chains they get freed and all the all this new life is filled with the power of the spirit and they resist the pressure of the culture surrounding them and that angers those who no longer can profit from them. And as you probably know, this passage, a great mob came up. The city was filled with confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater. I mean, imagine all those guys filled into one accord. That was a Honda joke. Anyway, 
They got there. They brought a couple of Christians, Gaius and, uh, Gaius and uh, who was the other guy? Aristarchus. And they began to, to yell. You know, it says here, for two hours. They kept shouting for two hours. But I love how uh, Luke says here, the whole city was in confusion. They kept shouting, but they had no idea what they were shouting about. It was just mob mentality and just shouting out their confusion to you know, one another, I guess. And that's where God comes and intervenes, working through a city official whose name is unknown, but whom God used to protect his church. Well, he needs to mute their mic. So this city official has some wise words. says, guys, keep calm. That's where those mugs come from, Mike, not from London. It's from this guy. Keep calm. Keep calm and follow the lead of the, of the law. Can someone mute the mics on Zoom, please? Uh, Jennifer, would you please make sure some, everybody's got the mic, mics muted? Okay. Um, and he says, these guys are not robbers. You guys are shot for two hours, but you're shutting for nothing. For these guys are just not robbers. You know, if, if you have something against them, I love this. You know, imagine this mob, 20,000 people gathered there. And this guy says, yo, if you got a problem, the court is in session. Just go to the tribunal. Just, just you know, call 911 or whatever. Just go to the, you know, it's, I didn't say that. You know, the court is in session, it says, go there. And let the lawful assembly, and this is emphasized, let the lawful assembly decide in the end, not a riot. So what is the lesson here? It's a whole 20 verse passage, which is, uh, you know, just God at work through these people, through these un, how say, not Christians. You know, just like in the Old Testament, when God rebuilt the temple and the city of Jerusalem with Gentile money, the money from the Babylonians or the Assyrians, God rebuilt the temple with that money. Like here, God again is protecting his church with, through this uh, unknown Greek or Roman uh, official here in Ephesus. God is at work. Even if you don't see him, God is at work. We sang this, I think, a week or two ago. Even when we don't see him, he is at work. Or something along those lines. Anna has this song that she, she brought here. Uh, you know, we don't have to see God to know that he can work. And he works not just through pastors and ministers. He can work through the, I don't know, through a police officer who never, never, never confessed the name of Jesus. He can work through our premier, you know. He can work through our premier. He can work even through our prime minister. And that's why we pray for him. We don't curse. We pray. Okay? That's what the Bible says. Pray for them. Got me? So this is the, the, the lesson of this, of this riot. You may think that God is, you know, not there. But he, he will protect his church. God will protect the ministry. If he wants something to happen in that place, God will make it happen. So let's bring this to, uh, to an end here. A couple of lessons from this passage, from this chapter. And I said this, we, we look at that first seven verses about this, that encounter between Paul and the disciples of John. And sometimes all we make is, is there a second baptism or not? But the point is, are we filled with the Spirit? We may not prophesy, we may not speak in tongues. I'm not going to focus on that. But are we filled with the Spirit? Do we walk as the Lord says? Ephesians 5, 15, 16, 17. Do not be filled with wine, but be filled, be continuously filled, is the meaning in Greek, with the Spirit. Is that our prayer every single day? Lord, help me to walk in the power of your Spirit. I have to commit. So I have to confess. Some mornings I wake up more desiring of coffee than of Spirit. But my prayer is that I, I, I grow as a Christian, I grow as a pastor, and my first thing when I open up my eyes would not be, Lord, where's the coffee? But Lord, fill me up so I can leave, live a day in your power, even today. That even before my feet hit the ground, I can say, Lord, lead me today also to meet those whom you want me to meet. It's a mindset. When we see our, our lives as important, when you see our lives as an integral part of God's kingdom and we have a role to play and God will use us. You may be 15 or 55 or 95. 
God wants to use you. And he wants to say to you, your life matters. You may say, I'm retired or I'm, uh, and I'm stuck at home and I work from, from my computer. And I see no one but my, my kids and my husband or my kids and my wife, whatever the case is. But the Lord can and will use you. Just pray. for the Just pray because the, the church is a supernatural entity where the Spirit of God is present and works in us. And the second thing is, from all those uh, two years plus three months of teaching in Ephesus of Paul, of Paul teaching in Ephesus, think about this. Perseverance. Daily perseverance. Always building up the church. Always doing it with patience. Not thinking about the short-term plans. Oh, I have three days to make sure Fred becomes a great Christian. It may take 30 years. Oh, hopefully not, Fred. Don't, don't get me wrong. You know, but it's about that perseverance. When they'll say, I'm going to work with Rudy, and if he doesn't change in three months, I give up on him. No, it's perseverance, building up the church, and the greatest test of ministry is this, our lives being changed. And I make a, I make a sorry, I'm, it's me. I sometimes, you know, uh, joke with, uh, with uh, Rudy and say, it was a great Sunday if I make Rudy cry. And that's usually not a, gar not a hard thing to do. But, <laughs> but that's not the greatest sign. You know, it's a joke. It, Rudy knows it's just a joke. The greatest sign for ministry, of success, success in ministry is lives changed. It may take three minutes. It may take three years or more. It's our perseverance. So of all these things, I, I think this. Be filled with the Spirit. For the church of God is the temple. You are also the temple of the Holy Spirit. Two, persevere. Keep teaching. Keep at it. Build a church. Build those around you. You don't have to be a teacher with a title. You don't have to have seminary. Teach your kids. Teach your wife. Teach your husband. Teach one another, you know, biblical way. And persevere. Make disciples. This were a place where you, we, want us, we want you, all of us here to belong. We also want you to grow. We want you to grow. And the growth comes not through the teaching of Adi only. I mean, I do my part. But everybody needs to do their part, you know, as we see this work of ministry happening through daily perseverance and building up with patience and looking for this great test of ministry, our lives being changed. And of course, there'll be power encounters because we have an enemy who opposes us, but we are not undefeated. Sorry. Blah. We're not walking defeated. Sorry. Remember that day when I called you, I told you that God hates you? you know? We are not walking as a defeated party. In Christ, we are more than conquerors. And soon, the God of peace will crush Satan under our feet. We're more than conquerors. But that, takes, that requires something. Faith as a first-hand experience. Not my mom's faith, not my son's faith, not my neighbor's faith but my faith. For you can say, and you should say, and you ought to say, in the name of Jesus, whom I know, whom I know, who is my king, I proclaim this. I ask for this. I beg for this. I pray for this. In the name of Jesus, for there is power in his name. But it's got to be a first-hand experience. So pray for, let you know, me here a note for Christian parents and even grandparents. Pray for the faith of your kids or grandkids. Sometimes they come to church and they do well. Just keep coming to church, Timothy. We bring them to church. We make them come to church. But coming to church don't make you a Christian. It's meeting Jesus that makes you a Christian. So pray that our kids have this encounter that changes their lives. Pray for my son, Matei, every day. Pray for my daughter, Emma every day and it's a struggle sometimes i ask questions am i a failure as a parent have i done something wrong but in the end their own their own they are their own souls hearts people you know they're they have to make their own choice i can take them so far and then they have to find their own way to god and god gave us me anna and i an encouragement through a friend a couple of days ago that god is not finished god has a major plan and one day, I, my dream will be fulfilled. And I will sit in, or stand actually, I will stand in the church. And I'll see Emma and Matei 
worshiping God because they chose to. I still pray and I still... Has, you know the word vision? Is that desired image of a preferred future that God gives to you? That's my desired image of a preferred future that God gives, gives me. Is me and Anna in the church worshiping with Emma and Matei. That's my vision. And I forgot where I said, oh yeah, there's power in the name of Jesus, but it's got to be a first-hand experience. And you know what? In the end, God is at work and God protects the work of ministry, even through people that do not acknowledge him as Lord. So don't fear. Do not be afraid. Just keep on doing what God has called you and God will build his church and God will protect his ministry. He'll do it in many ways, and he, but he will do it. So trust him. Be filled with the Spirit. Keep on doing the work of ministry. Be ready to proclaim the name of Jesus as the greatest power in this universe. And trust in God that he will protect and he will keep on building his church. Amen? Let's pray together.